books. Let's start with a song again, all right? Grab your blue hymn book in front of you. 295. 295, Wonderful Words of Life. All right, obviously last week and this week, our theme is victory through the word. We must have the word to have victory. So let's get our thoughts on the word tonight with first verse of 295, Wonderful Words of Life. take a moment and take any prayer requests that we can pray for. And I'll tell you what, Chris, if you wouldn't mind, if you can hear well enough, you want to keep track of these and then pray for us? All right. Brother Paul. He had to fix it today, so he tore into it. I think he got it fixed. He, he did get it fixed. He went and got the parts and got it fixed, and it's working. But all of this has been, uh, uh, they've all been sick there. The, uh, Karen, that's his wife, uh, she's been really sick. And it's gone through all the, the children. And so they just aren't getting any reprieve. So we're praying for a time of rest to come through. Oh, sure. The midst of this. Well, praise God, it wasn't worse. My goodness. It could have been so much worse. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord for that. Okay, what else? Other prayer requests. Yes, ma'am. Um, I mentioned in Sunday school a couple times my former student, Chloe, that just had her leg amputated. That was just on Friday. And she left for home yesterday. Um, she met all the goals they set for her. So I'm just praying that she continues to feel well and that the cancer's gone. Okay. Uh, Judas said he's on his way. He'll be here in a couple wow. days, and so he'll uh, he'll actually be at church on Sunday. Good. And okay. uh, he was praying for a place to stay, and he found a place to stay. So Good. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Do you know if he's staying in the Shelby area? He said North Carolina, but I'm not sure. Okay. Good. 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 Right. Uh, praise be with uh, Sal, my old car. Okay. Praise the Lord. Anything else? All right, Brother Chris, if you would, go ahead and pray for him. Father, we come before you this evening, Lord. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house tonight, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to freely assemble in, in uh, the free country, Lord, that we live in. 
Lord, we thank you for the, uh, the, the many provisions that you give for us, Lord. Sometimes we forget when the AC unit's out in half the church or whatever and things like that, just how, how important it is to be able to uh, pray about little things and then have those little things taken care of, Lord. We thank you for uh, that being repaired, Lord. We thank you for uh, the good number that came on the van tonight, Lord, and the good number here, Lord. We do think the requests that were mentioned tonight, Lord. Uh, we think of uh, Sam and Aaron, their situation with their AC unit, Lord. Uh, thank you that it uh, wasn't any more serious than it was, Lord. We know that fire can spread so quick and can be so devastating and uh, can, can definitely uh, alter a, uh, the course of someone's life very, very rapidly, Lord. And thank you for uh, allowing that to be as minor as it was and that Sam was able to get that taken care of, Lord. I just pray for um, Aaron as, as, as she, with all of uh, her medical issues, Lord. I pray that uh, you continue to... Uh, uh, strengthen her that she'll be feeling better and the kids as well uh, that you just encourage them Lord we think of this one Chloe uh, with the amputation Lord uh, I just pray that uh, you would continue to help her to uh, give her the strength she needs so that she can recuperate from this and learn um, how to be able to deal with this uh, this this limitation that she has Lord I just pray that uh, you just uh, be with them Lord and, and encourage her help her to be a uh, blessing uh, to Chloe Lord we think of Nye, Lord, as uh, she's been test positive for uh, COVID, Lord, again. I just pray that you would uh, uh, encourage her, Lord, that uh, she'll be able to uh, get the rest that she needs, Lord, and, and that'll be a, a mild case of it and be able to get through it quick, Lord. Seems like that's kind of making a resurgence, Lord, and I just pray that uh, that, uh, that would be uh, just an easy, uh, not too difficult, not too painful, not too miserable uh, situation for her. We think of Judah as he's traveling, Lord. I just pray that you give him mercy, Lord, uh, as he journeys, Lord. We know that a lot of times trying to catch different flights and customs and everything with, with COVID and any restrictions and things like that, I pray that you just give him journey mercies, Lord, as he travels back to the States, Lord. We do think of the blessing that it is that he has found a place to stay for the next semester. Um, I just pray that uh, you just continue to bless him, Lord. We're excited about hearing what, uh, what the Lord's been doing. It's been fun to see his updates, Lord. Um, online and, and just see how the different situations he's been in and how you've used him and the uh, the experience that he's gaining is just invaluable, Lord. And thank you that he had an opportunity to do that, Lord. We thank you for the uh, for the blessing with Ryan and Callie that they were able to sell the uh, their old vehicle, Lord. And we thank you so much, Lord, how you provide the necessities like a vehicle, Lord. And thank you for, for providing them a nice little SUV to run around in and uh, just uh, good on gas and. and good safe vehicle for them to uh, be able to get to and from church and work and commitments that they have Lord pray now that you will bless our time together tonight Lord I pray that you would bless uh, the young people as they're outside that uh, they would just have a great time great time of fellowship uh, keep them healthy hydrated out here Lord that we won't have any heat related um, illness or anything like that Lord and I pray that uh, you be with Joe as he opens the word uh, to us tonight Lord we do love you we pray all these things in your name amen, amen. thank you all right, I want to put a question in your mind. Put you a little bit on the spot, all right? It's not Valentine's Day, but I want you to consider if you were to set out to write the best poem or even just letter that you could to express your devotion to your spouse, okay? If that was your goal, to set out to write the best poem or the best letter that you could to express your devotion to your spouse, how elaborate and creative would that letter be, right? How, how good of a poem would you write? And you might say, well, poetry is not really my gift, okay? And I get that for some it is and for some it isn't. But how much devotion could you express in that poem, right? How about this one that I thought up, okay? If you need help, maybe it could be this. Roses are red, violets are blue. This is a poem. I wrote it for you, right? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Okay. <laughs> I would hope it would be better than that, all right? Uh, but better yet, what if you set out to write a poem of devotion to express your love for God's word? What would that poem look like, right? If you poured your heart out to express your love for God's word and your love for the fruit that God's word brings about in your life and its ministry to you and its benefits and its protections and how much you need it, and how much you long to have more of it in your life, and how desperate you are to live it, and how powerless you are to live it without the Lord's help. If you were to pour that out, what would that look like? How long would that poem be? How elaborate would that poem be, right? Well, the reason that I'm putting those thoughts in your mind is because that's exactly what Psalm 119 is, right? You're probably already there in your mind with me. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 119. 
Psalm 119 could have been written by David. That's not really the most important point tonight. Uh, most people assume it was David. There are people who argue that maybe it was Ezra, maybe it was Daniel. Um, I'll probably end up saying David, even though I'm not 100% sure if it was David, but it can be tonight, and that's not the most important thing, all right? But the author of Psalm 119 uh, obviously is a person who is deeply impacted by the Word of God. This man loved God's Word, and it just poured out in this beautiful, elaborate poem, right? Uh, so Psalm 119 is the longest, most elaborate, and I think the most heartfelt poem in the Psalter. That's hard to say, though, because they all they all come from a very deep place in the heart. Uh, but it's clearly the longest and the most elaborate, right? You probably know this already, but it is an elaborate acrostic poem, meaning each stanza starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet, right? So there's 22 stanzas in Psalm 119 because there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Um, not only does each stanza start with the same letter, but they start with each next letter. In other words, stanza A all starts with the letter A if we were using the English alphabet. Stanza B all starts with the letter B. Stanza C all starts with the letter C. Of course, it's Hebrew, so it's Aleph, Beth, and the other ones. Okay, um, there's other ones that I can't remember. Um, so it's not just that it is such a heartfelt poem, but a lot of thought went into this. Now, I recognize that this was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But you have to wonder, and we don't know the answer to this question, but you have to wonder, did this poem pour out of this author under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit all at once? I, I kind of wonder if it wasn't something that grew over time, if it, if it wasn't something that kind of accumulated and was organized over time. I, that's my guess. I don't know that for sure. Um, but if you were to try to do this in English, Right? How quickly would you think of eight sentences that start with Q, for instance? Right? You just kind of wonder if these things came over time as, as a relationship with God's Word was ongoing. But, um, but there's 176 verses in Psalm 119, and all but about four of them-ish make reference to the Word of God in one way or another. It's all about God's Word and its impact on my heart. And that's really our point tonight. Our, our theme last week and this week has been victory through the Word. And last week, we looked at Jesus' use of the word to overcome temptation, right? We can't overcome temptation without the sword of the Spirit. We also looked at Jesus' use of the shield of faith, so to speak, right? Remember, Jesus' example was, I believe what God says, and he says, right? Shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. But tonight, really, I want to challenge all of us to look at Psalm 119 and elsewhere to see that God wants me to experience the blessednesses, and I know that that's not a word. We're going to come back to that word. But the blessedness is of having a heart fully impacted by the Word of God. A heart fully impacted by the Word of God, right? God put this psalm in the Bible for a lot of reasons, mainly to continually inspire us to pursue after God and His Word more and more. We need the Word, right? And you come and spend time in Psalm 119, and it's just constantly a reminder, I need a heart like that, right? So wherever you are in your relationship with God's Word tonight, you could be in a great place, maybe better than you've been in a long time in your personal relationship with God, and I would praise God for that. But maybe this psalm can help inspire you even more to ask God, give me, give me more of a heart for God's Word. I pray that God's Word would have even more impact on my heart, right? If you're not in a good place, maybe this can spur you to really ask God's help in that regard, okay? But God wants us to experience the blessednesses of a heart wholly impacted by His Word. All right, why am I using such an odd word? Well, to start with, I think one of the first points that, that the psalmist wants us to see in this psalm is that to have a heart wholly impacted by God's word is to experience a truly blessed life. A truly blessed life. Look at the first couple of verses. Psalm 119.1. We'll just, I'll say David because again, I'll say it, and it probably is David. But anyway, David says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with what? with the whole heart, right? Note that word blessed, right? We see it, of course, we recognize that, that word from which other psalm? Which other psalm starts with that word? Psalm, Brother Paul's got it, Psalm 1, right? You're thinking through it. Uh, this word shows up 30-something times in the Old Testament, most of which are in the Psalms. It's a huge word, and it's always plural, uh, which I think is why we kind of capture that idea when I, when I use a made-up word like blessedness is, okay? It's, it's, it's the idea of 
one who is truly, genuinely prosperous and experiencing genuinely God's blessing. This is a big, deep word in the Old Testament. If you were a, a, a Jew in the Old Testament, you wanted to be Asherah. You wanted to be blessed. And the Psalms uses this word over and over again to show us what kind of life is truly Asherah. What kind of life is truly blessed? Well, according to Psalm 119, it's the man who walks in the law of the Lord. The word controls his heart and mind, right? He walks, therefore, or rather, he, verse 2, he seeks the Lord with his whole heart. So God is holding up a picture for us in this psalm of the truly blessed life. Right? If we're not careful, we can look at other things and get caught up in thinking, man, that looks like the blessed life. Right? There are people who have less problems than we have, people who have more resources than we have. Uh, they seem to have more leisure than we have. Things go better for them than they go for us. There are certain neighborhoods in town you drive through and you think, this is not the neighborhood I live in, right? These people, man, they've, whatever they're doing to live here must be going well for them, right? But God's holding up for us a different picture here, that if we're not careful, we look at these other things and we think, yeah, that's, man, that's the blessed life. And the psalmist says, I'll tell you who's really blessed. It's the man who walks in the law of the Lord, right? He has the word fully impacting his heart. All right, but let's consider the heart for a minute here as we get started. Because the second thing is that God means for his word to impact every facet of our heart, right? David says that he that, that seeks the Lord with his whole heart, and that's a helpful phrase to look for in Psalm 119. You'll see a lot of references to the heart and some references to the whole heart. Well, let's consider that for a minute because it's another huge Old Testament word with a lot of meaning, right? The lave or the heart. It can mean your physical organ that pumps blood, okay? It does mean that in some cases like, um, is it Jehu? who shot his arrow and it pierced right through the wicked king's lave, his heart. Okay, clearly, you know, that's not the conscience being pricked. I mean, that's his physical heart, right? But mostly when this word is used, and it's used hundreds of times in the Old Testament, it mostly refers to my inner man. It is, it is everything that makes up who I am on the inside, all right? So in other words, the heart, according to the way it's used in the Bible, is the seat of my mind or my thinking, I devise things in my heart. I think in my heart. I reason in my heart. I plan in my heart, according to the Old Testament. But it's also the seat of my will, my decision-making, my choosing. Uh, my heart can be hardened or rebellious. My heart can be uh, willing to this or that or whatever. But my heart is where I make decisions. Thirdly, it's the seat of my emotions, my feeling, my wanting, my longing, my passions motivations, those things, right? It's the mind, will, and emotions. Every aspect of my inner man is summed up in this big, huge word, your heart. So it's a really important part of us, right? In essence, it is us, okay? It represents my whole inner man. It's the seat of my values, my faith, my choices, and therefore, it's the director of the whole direction of my life, right? Because there really is a sense in which my life will move in the direction of my thoughts and choices, right? Uh, our, our pastor that we had for a number of years at Faith uh, used to say it this way, that I will always move in the direction of my most dominant thoughts, right? I'll always move in the direction of my most dominant thoughts. So the condition of my heart is of utmost importance. It determines the way I think. It determines the way I respond and feel. It determines the choices that I make. Your heart is really, really important. Proverbs 4.23 says that we should uh, guard or keep our heart with all diligence for out of it, what? are the issues of life, right? So I used to look at that word and think that issues there was the idea of like problems or like you have issues at work or we say, man, that guy's got issues, right? Uh, but it's more so the idea of like when Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood, there was a flowing of blood. She was internally bleeding. She had a blood flow problem, okay? Uh, that's the idea of issue. Life issues forth out of your heart. It's your heart that determines everything about your life. That's why we need to guard or keep our heart because the condition of our heart determines the way we live our life, the way we respond to life circumstances, the choices we make, and so forth. So we need to guard it or keep it. Proverbs 23, 7 says that uh, in, in the context there is talking about a man who can't be trusted. He's flattering you, but it says that as he thinks in his heart, so is he, right? Regardless of what a man says to you or the nice way he might treat you, be careful because as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Jesus says something similar when he says, out of the abundance of the heart, what? 
mouth speaketh, right? All these things originate in my heart. In fact, Jesus makes the point that it's not things that we bring into us that defile us. Where does defilement come from? It comes from the heart, comes from within a man and comes out of him, right? It's the heart that's the factory of all these garbage things that defile a man. So the heart is who I truly am. It's really important. That's why God means for his word to not be merely for my brain, right? I can't just know things about God's word. I can't just be intellectually stimulated when I come to church and learn and hear things and think, well, that was neat to hear. The word is not merely for my brain. God means for his word to have functional control over my whole heart, everything that controls the, the direction and decisions of my life. So a helpful way to study Psalm 119, if you're looking for a neat way to have your devotions for a little while, um, I found this to be a really helpful exercise a little bit in the past. A helpful way to study one, Psalm 119 is to slowly make your way through it looking for or trying to identify, is this a reference to the mind, the will, or the emotions? And I would add another one, even though it's really a function of the will, so to speak. But I would add faith, because David says a lot of things like, I hope in your word, I, I pray, I trust, things like that. And that's an exercise of his faith. But I found that to be a really helpful exercise as you go through Psalm 119, right? So in my Bible, and you can do it the way you choose to do it, some people don't like marking in their Bible. I really enjoy marking up my Bible. I usually always use pencil, uh, just for my own sake, because I usually end up misspelling something or I have to correct it or whatever. Or later on, I'll need to move it and make room for something else or whatever. Um, here and there, I'll use colored pencils. But I'm always a little nervous of that because you can't erase those. And so I guess I just got to like get over that and be okay with marking in my Bible and it just staying there. But, uh, but the way, at least, that I found that helped me okay, was... Um, if it was a reference to the mind, I used a circle. Um, if it was a reference to the will and action, I used a triangle. And if it was a reference to emotions, I used a square. And then I just went through, and if I saw a word like, I long for your precepts, what would that be? What aspect of my heart is that? I long for your precepts. It's your emotions, right? Yeah, it's your affections. Okay, so put a square around the word long. Uh, I will keep your word. That one I find a little tricky because that involves my attention and my mind. I got to keep it in my thoughts, but also I have, it, it's, an, it's a choice. I am choosing to guard your word or whatever. So anyway, I find that to be a really helpful exercise to go through Psalm 119 and my devotions for a while and just kind of meditating my way through and thinking. And what you'll find when you're done, whatever system you use to identify it, number one, Psalm 119 will be all marked up because every verse is a reference to some aspect of the heart pretty much. Um, and then secondly, you'll see that it really is talking about every facet of my heart. It really is talking about the word having an impact on my mind, my will, and my emotions. And of course, it influences my faith, right? So God really does mean for his word to have functional control that way. But let me just say a word right from the outset. And this is true. This, this is one of those things that really ought to be said anytime anybody preaches about the word. Psalm 119 isn't just intended to hold up for us what we ought to desire, but it really is intended to drive us to our knees in dependence on God. I can't love God's word like this in and of myself. I can't live God's word in and of myself. I can't even want to live God's word in and of myself, right? Maybe you've had the same experience that I've had where you have good days, man, where you really want to be closer to God and you really want God to do some good things in your heart and you're even praying for good right, necessary things for God to do in your heart because you want to be closer to God and you want to be godly. And you also sin, right? And you're also weak and you also fail. And then maybe that same day you become under conviction because you've, something has changed in your circumstances and you've gotten in the flesh and you just are weak. Uh, Psalm 119, it, it, nobody should be, should be preaching Psalm 119 or any other passage saying, just go do this. Because we can't do that right? Just because God commands us to do something doesn't mean we naturally have the ability to do it. He does expect us to obey and to do the things he calls us to do, but he means for us to depend on him to do it, right? He is the one that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, right? So can you simply will this kind of overflowing praise and living into being? No. So the point tonight is not to go home and say, okay, well, I just need to want this more, well, we do need to want it more, but where we need to start is by admitting to God our inability to have this kind of heart and asking God to change us to have more of a desire for his word. And that's kind of the way David talks throughout Psalm 119. Some of his verses, a lot of his verses, are prayers that God would do more of this in his heart, right? Why can't we want this? And we're going to come back to this question as well later on. 
But why is it so hard for us? Why is our relationship with God's word not what it should be any given day? Even when it's great, it could be better, right? But probably all of us, if we're honest, would say there's plenty of times when I am not loving God's word like I should. I'm not consistently in God's word. I'm not thinking God's word. I'm not obeying God's word right now. Well, remember, the Bible says, at best, our flesh is weak, right? Matthew 26, 41, Jesus says, the spirit truly is willing. You want good things, but what's the character of the flesh? It is weak. At best, our flesh is weak. We just, at best, don't have the ability to do these things because of our flesh. Romans 8, 3 says the same thing. The flesh is weak. It's why we couldn't fulfill the law, so to, uh, in other words. It's why we needed Jesus to fulfill the law, because we can't do it. But worse... Not just as the flesh weak, but Romans 8, 7 says that the flesh, the carnal mind, is at enmity with God and is not subject to what? Do you remember? To the law of God. Why do I find it so hard to stay loving my Bible? Because I have a flesh that doesn't want to be under the sound of the Bible, right? I have a part of me that doesn't want to be subject to God's word that is resistant to the direction of God through his word. And I wish that wasn't the case, you wish that wasn't the case, but at least that weakness makes us have to depend on God, right? God has wired, I don't mean to make God responsible for our sin, but God has left us in a condition with the flesh that makes us have to depend on God day by day. So I have this flesh that is resistant to this, right? Why is it so easy to think up excuses for why I don't need to spend time in my Bible today, right? Why is it so easy to get distracted and caught up? Why is it so much easier to do something mindless and entertaining than to really spend some time meditating on God's word because I haven't in three days or so to speak, right? Because I have this flesh that wants something else. So again, Philippians 2.13, God is the one who must work in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So as you look at Psalm 119, it ought to be inspiring. It ought to be something we look at and think, man, I wish I had a heart like that. Lord, I need a heart like that. But then the next right thing to be praying is, Lord, would you do more of this in me? Right? Would you give me a desire for this? Would you give me the, the grace to do this? Would you help me day by day do what I'm supposed to be doing to feed my heart in the word and so forth? Right? I see recurring themes throughout the psalm. Okay, first, I think I, I would see that David recognizes and praises the blessedness of living the way of the word. Right? A lot of the verses in this psalm are praising what the word does in his life, and, and it's, it's praise for how blessed it is to live the way of the word, right? It's a lot of praise. But David also longs to experience more of this blessedness, right? He's praying that God will do more of this. He wants this. I want to walk in your way faithfully. I want these things to be true for me. There's a longing there. And so thirdly, David therefore resolves to live this kind of life. There's a lot of verses like that. I will meditate on your, your precepts. I will keep your word. I will obey. I will do this. I will do that. And then there's a sense in which, like all of us who are raising or have raised kids, right, um, our kids look at us and they say things like, if we get a dog, I will feed it every day. I will take care of it, right? I will. I'll walk it every day. I'll get up early and take it out to the bathroom. I will, right? Do they mean that? I think in that moment they mean that, right? But we parents look at them and we think, mm, give it a week and then you won't want to. Now, does God write us off like that? No, but the point is, the reason that David follows up with a fourth theme, not only does he resolve, I will do this by God's grace, but fourthly, he knows he can't unless the Lord enables him, so he prays for God to help him live this way. That's a lot of the verses in Psalm 119. Keep me in this way. One of the verses I find really instructive and resembling my own heart is where David says, Make me to go in the way of, uh, in, in your way, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, for therein do I delight. I find that really instructive. I, I don't know that I've ever had to tell somebody, look, would you please make sure that I eat ice cream because I love ice cream, right? And I do, and you do, and it's great. I hope you do, because it'd be really weird to not. I mean, there's plenty of ice cream out there to like if you don't like normal ice cream. Don't just not like ice cream. Um, but I do, okay, uh, things that are very chocolatey and peanut buttery and fudgy and whatnot, especially. But I have never had to ask an accountability partner to help make sure I eat ice cream because, man, I love it. But David says in Psalms, make me go in this way, for therein do I delight. Why would you have to pray that? Well, because there's a part of you that won't stay in that way. Man, when I'm in it, when I'm walking with God, when I'm in the word of God, when God's feeding me from his word, I delight to walk according to God's word and walk hand in hand with him and be in, in fellowship with him. I love when the word is, is feeding my soul because I love God. 
and I'm a sinner who keeps going my own way, and I won't stay in the right path, right? And I keep wandering off to go my own way, so I need God's help. So in other words, I think if you could boil these themes down to a, to a, a few sentences here, at least as I meditate in Psalm 119, I hear David saying something like, Oh, the blessedness of living the way of the word. I want more of that blessedness for me. I will pursue after it, but Lord, you have to help me. Right? I hear him saying all those things. And I think that's the right way for us to approach something like Psalm 119. Lord, I need a closer relationship with you through your word. You've got to help me. You've got to give me more desire, and you've got to give me grace because I'm tired. And you've got to give me wisdom and grace to fit it into my schedule because I'm, I'm busy. And I recognize all those realities. We gotta long for this and pray for it, right? So now let's consider another verse here alongside this, all right? Because Psalm 119, and I recognize that we're not walking all through it. There is 176 verses. So lest you wonder, is this where we're going to start going through it verse by verse? We're not going to go through it verse by verse, all right? Um, I'm banking on your familiarity with it. But we are going to park our attention now on a different verse. So keep a finger in Psalm 119 and turn over to Colossians 3 and verse 16. Okay, Colossians 3 and verse 16. Because I think Psalm 119 sounds a lot like a person who is living Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you what? richly in all wisdom. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And when, as, as that is increasingly true, your heart sounds more and more like Psalm 119, right? I love God's word. So I think they go hand in hand there. Last week, we considered the overlap from Psalm, uh, rather, Ephesians 5.18 and Colossians 3.16, right? Do you remember this, that there's a connection there? Um, and the reason I say the overlap is because Ephesians 5.18 tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Really, it's, it's, it's ongoing. It's be being filled with the Spirit in a sense. And then certain things flow out of me as a result. Things like praising and singing and ministering and even submitting to one another and so forth. And then Colossians 3.16 has a little different instructions, but almost the same results. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then we note that certain things flow out of us in the passage in Colossians 3. Things like singing and giving praise and admonishing one another and being thankful. And very similar things to Ephesians 5. So there's a connection between being filled with the Spirit and the Word of Christ dwelling in you richly. In other words, the more the Word dwells in me richly, the more I can be Spirit-controlled, right? Because we made the point last week that the Spirit largely, his, his primary tool is the Word. That's the language the Spirit speaks. And so the more Word I have in my heart and mind and keeping it there, the more I'm going to recognize and have grace to submit to the Spirit's influence in my life, right? But what does it mean for the word of Christ to dwell in you richly? Right? It's a neat phrase to be thinking about. I've done some, been thinking and meditating on this, and I found it really helpful. To dwell in you richly. That word dwell means literally to reside at home. Right? You talk about your dwelling. Uh, legally, there's a bunch of fine print out there in the legal world between your domicile and your dwelling and your residence and whatnot. And I recognize there's those differences. We're talking about the place where you call home, your dwelling. Right? Not where you are sometimes, but your home. Right? For the word to reside at home in your heart richly is the idea of Colossians 3.16. So it's not an occasional visitor. It resides at home in your heart. Right? So let's think about that for a minute. It's an interesting thought to meditate on. Meditate on it with me for a minute. You may, may think of some of the same things I've recognized or different ones. What makes the difference between merely staying or being somewhere and being in your home, right? We all know the difference. We know when we're home and when we're not. Some travel more than others. Some get to be home more than others. But we all know the difference, right? It's easy to recognize, okay, I'm in a hotel room. I am not at home. I'm staying in someone else's home. Uh, I'm homeless, okay? We all know the difference there. So what is it that makes a particular place your home? What do you think? Let's chew on it for a minute. What is it that makes the place that you consider home, home? What makes it different from other places? Okay. Ah, so there is an ownership. There's possession of these things. Okay. What else? 
Okay, in what sense? Yeah, there's an authority there, right? You have the prerogative to make the decisions because it's your home, right? We say to guests, make yourself at home. And we mean in a polite way, make yourself a little more comfortable than you are right now, right? We don't mean, you now make all the decisions. You leave never if you want to, right? We don't mean that. Um, we don't mean if you don't like my furniture or decorations or where the walls are in my house, you make the decisions. It's your home, right? Um, you buy the food and you do all this. We don't mean all those things. But when it is your home, you're right. There is an authority there that I get to make the decisions because this is my home, right? Our family was really thankful that we had uh, a temporary place to live with my wife's mother for a while. We were with her for six months, actually. We, weren't, we didn't think we'd be with her quite that long, but it's just how the Lord led. We ended up being there six months. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a blessing to her, and it was a blessing to us, and we have a good relationship, and all was well. But it's still, it's not the same as being in your own home, right? I mean, you all recognize that. Maybe you've had similar seasons. Okay, but what else? So there's, there's possession there. There's authority. What else? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I had a similar thought there. In other words, um, you've left your particular imprint, right? Your possessions are there, your pictures, your decorations. It's apparent to visitors that it is you that lives there, right? Uh, I, I was sitting at my desk thinking about this, and I thought, okay, if somebody all of a sudden somehow found themselves sitting here at this spot like I am and didn't know where they were. I guess, I guess if you just got really disoriented, and somehow, I don't know, maybe our family picked you up on the side of the road or something, and you ended up finding yourself sitting there at my desk in our bedroom, and you're trying to figure out, where am I, right? And I, I was thinking about this, thinking, how, at what would tell you where you are? And I had to look around and think, okay, not necessarily that and that. And then finally, up here on the top, I have a little antique secretary thing that belonged to my great-grandparents, I think. But anyway, there's a few shelves on it, and on the top of them is a picture of our family. Ah, that would clue you in, okay? Uh, let's say you're in a house and you're trying to figure out where you're at and you're walking down the hall and on the wall is a beautiful picture of the Harris family, all right? And then, and you're like, oh, okay, well, this must be the Harris's house. But then you keep walking and then you see a picture of the Lucas's family. And you're like, this is weird, right? I didn't expect that. And then you see a picture of the Ledoux's family, right? And then you know I'm in Pastor Mike's house. That's where I'm at, okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. But your home is where you've left your imprint. It's your home. It's not somebody else's home, Right? Uh, it'll take you about 14 seconds to figure out if you walk into Nate and Elizabeth's home uh, that you're in their house because you're in Ohio State country when you walk into their house, right? It's quite obvious when you walk into their house that you're in an Ohio State. It's, it's, it, it is obvious. It is, it's not, like, oh, it's not uh, like gratuitous. It's obvious. Okay. That's fine. All right. Um, but yeah, you've left your imprint. What else? Anything else come to your mind? How do you know when it's your home? Yes, it's sir. what you know. You're familiar with it. Yeah. And everything. It's what you're comfortable with. That's true. That is true. There's a comfort level there, right? Ah, I can rest and be at home here, right? I'm familiar with this. My familiar people are here as well, right, usually. Anything else? How do you know when you are in your home? It is the last stop. Hmm. You know, it's just yeah. like when everything else, you know, travels and whatnot, like this is where I'm going. Yeah. It is the last stop. Yeah, yeah, and a, a, a similar, a, I guess the a way it was on my mind in a similar way was, this is where I characteristically am. This is where I typically am found. I might go other places, but I typically return to my home, right? That's how I know when I'm home, because I'm done being elsewhere, right? That kind of thing. And you may have had some other thoughts too, but this has been helpful for me to think about. So what makes your place your home? Well, we already said to have possession, to be in charge, to be the decision maker. To have the prerogative to arrange and function within however you please, right? You know you're at home when you can do that. To characteristically be there. This is your typical place of being, your place of belonging, the place where you are typically found, right? You might be away from home, some, but people know that if they can't find you anywhere else, at least wait long enough at your home and they'll find you because that's where you typically are, right? To be in the place where you belong and not in a place dedicated to someone or something else, right? I might, you, if, if you came home one day and found me in your home, right, and my shoes are off and my feet are up, right, and I helped myself to the fridge, and you might think, 
oh, I didn't know you were coming to visit. They're like, oh, no, I live here now, right? This is my home. And you'd think, no, this is my home, right? You, you, you can't live here. I live here, right? Well, my home is a place dedicated to me. There's nothing else I have to compete with there, except my family. But there's nothing else I have to compete with there. It's my home, right? It's our home. I want us all to be there. All right. Um, but it's a place dedicated to me. And then, like we said also, it's the place where you've left your particular imprint. Your possessions are there, your pictures, your decorations. So this is a helpful train of thought for me as I think about what does it mean for the word to dwell at home, to reside at home in your heart richly. Is the word, does it have the prerogative to make the decisions and be in control of your heart, your lave, your decision maker, your mind, your will, your emotions? Is it, an, is it a welcome guest? I like when the word is around, but I'm in charge around here. Or is it that, no, the word is in charge around here. The word lives here. The word calls the shots here, right? Is it characteristically there? I get that we all get sidetracked, we all get distracted, but increasingly is the word characteristically in your heart? Could I find it there, right? Has it left its particular imprint? Is there evidence on your life that, man, the word lives there? That guy, you can see that the word has a ministry in his life. And that's a cool thing. It's one of the things that we love about this church, quite honestly, is there's such frequent testimony of the word of God at work in people's lives. And that's been an encouragement to us being here. But that's a cool thing when you get around somebody, you can just tell, man, God's doing something really neat in that person's life right now. The word is at work in that guy's life. That's awesome. You can see it there. And another question I found to be helpful, okay? Let's say you're walking down the, the road in your neighborhood. You're on a walk. How would you know the difference between a house that is being lived in and a house that is vacant? Both of them are homes, but how would you know if one is vacant? How do you know when someone is home? Now, the word is supposed to be at home, in my heart. How would you know when someone's home? Well, you might see them there, right? If you see them coming and going, if they're outside working on the yard or whatever, um, that would be evidence, okay, they're home. Or if you don't see them, you could at least maybe find them there. If you went looking for them, if you knocked on the door, if you called them, they're there, all right? You might find them there. Um, there, there would be some sort of signs or evidence from without that they are within, right? There should be some sort of evidence that they are within. So if the word is at home in my heart, there ought to be some sort of evidence that the word is living within, right? you would see somebody, in other words, if, if, if again, if you were trying to tell the difference between a vacant house and a house where somebody's living there, there'd be some sort of signs that things are operating within. There's coming and going. Uh, there'd be signs of life. You'd see sights, sounds, there'd be smells, right? Lights would come on and off. Blinds would open and close. Um, even down to like the red flag on the mailbox would move from time to time, right? I mean, things, things would be changing. Things would be happening. There'd be evident signs of life there, okay? Um, there's upkeep and maintenance and cleaning and repairs. How do you know when a home is vacant, right? There's certain times when you're, if you routinely walk in your neighborhood, there may be occasions where you start noticing one house and think, I don't think anybody lives there anymore, right? Nothing has changed in a while. Nobody's mowing. Nobody's cleaning anything up, right? That newspaper is getting soggy and nasty. It's been sitting there for days. I don't think anybody's, what? Home. Well, in a spiritual sense, I wonder if people could walk past our life and say that. Man, I'm not sure if the word is home there. Nothing's changing, right? Things are getting a little more unkempt and sloppy and gross looking and there needs to be some maintenance and somebody needs to mow. Like some of you helped us move into our house and I wanted so desperately the week before or the days before volunteers came to help us unload our truck and move in, I, I kept telling Kimberly, I've got to go over there and mow. I've got to go over there and mow. I've got to weed eat. And she was like, you know there's not time for that. Let's just worry about getting the house clean and ready for people to move stuff in, and then you can mow later on. And, and for whatever reason, it had not been mowed in probably, a, Nate and I were speculating, probably a month. It probably had been a month since it had been mowed. It was a meadow. It was a jungle. Um, I have a lot of green weeds, and when you keep them real short, it looks real good. And so, and it was a mess. And, so, and it looks fine now, but man, the day volunteers came, I thought, they're going to think I live this way. And Kimberly was like, they know, you, don't, you don't haven't even been here. I'm like, but still, they're going to assume this is where we live. <laughs> but it needed to be mowed, right? It just looked bad. And there's a sense in which if the word is not having a regular influence in my life, things get 
they get unkempt, they get sloppy, they get spiritually gross, they get out of hand, right? The word, if it's at home, it ought to be operating, it ought to be maintaining things, keeping it clean, doing repairs, right? Some people spiritually, the blinds are hanging off, or the, the shutters are hanging off the outside of their house. There's a big hole in the roof. There's, you know, there's cracked windows. There's cobwebs, that kind of stuff. And they're like, man, I love God's word. I'm like, well, I, it doesn't look like it's doing a whole lot in your life right now, right? It, it needs to be home. But generally speaking, things change. They happen. They move around. All right. So the word of Christ needs to dwell at home richly in our hearts. I need a heart like that. And I'm guessing you need a heart like that, all right? Again, even if presently you would say, lately I have had some of the best time in the word I've had in a while. I hope that's true. And still, we look at a Psalm 119 and the praise there and we think, Phew, but I need more of a heart like that. All right, Lord, you need to be even more in control of my heart. Give me more of a heart like this and give me a desire for it. So the word needs to be living and at home here, all right? So let's consider this question for a minute as you turn over to James 1. James 1, how does one get the word more and more into their heart this way? Right? How does one get the word into their heart this way? We're supposed to have the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. So how does the word come to be at home in your heart? Well, at least this is true. Okay? James 1, 21 to 25 has a lot to say about our relationship to God's word. It would help if I would turn there. Can't teach James 1 from Colossians 3. James 1, 21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, in other words, abundance of wickedness, and receive with meekness, humility, the engrafted what? Word, which is able to save your souls. And that's not just your salvation, but also your ongoing salvation in a sense, God saving us from the presence of sin in our life right? The ongoing sanctification process. Um, it's not that God is done doing his work once we're saved. The event of our salvation is done at the time we put our trust in Christ. Then there's the ongoing process of learning to be like Christ. And that's a sense in which God is saving us, right? And the word is able to do that. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso, what, looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work. I always find that to be an instructive detail there. It's not a doer of the word, it's a doer of the work. Right? It's work to live the word. This man shall be blessed in his deed. All right, so we can't park here. There's just too much to park here. It's a whole other message um, to concentrate on James 1. But I just want to draw your attention to the idea there, verse 21, to receive with meekness the engrafted word, right? This is beyond merely hearing it with my ears. To receive with meekness is a heart condition, right? It is a heart that says, I need this. Lord, I'm listening with my spiritual ears. I'm ready to hear what you have to say. And by God's grace, I'm going to live what you have to say to me, right? What is it you need to say to me, Lord? I'm listening. To receive with meekness the engrafted word. The opposite of that, of course, would be pride, right? To not be listening. We have to be really careful of our tendency to hear sermons for other people, right? Ooh, that's good. So-and-so needs that, right? I wish so-and-so had been here. That would have been a help to him or a help to her, right? I hope so-and-so is listening right now, right? Because they need this. Or, or even, even just in, in think, a way we think is... Is good. It concerned for our family, for instance, right? Uh, this would be so helpful to my spouse, or this would be so helpful to my kids. And those things may well be true, but obviously our first inclination needs to be, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? How do I need what you're saying right now? Help me hear what your word says, right? To receive with meekness. And he came, he went on in verse 25 and said, but he that looketh into, it's a really neat word, in the Gospels, this word is used when, after Jesus' resurrection, when Peter and John raced each other to the tomb, right? And I always find it really interesting. You know which Gospel writer it is that mentions not once, not twice, but three times that he got there before Peter? It's John, right? It's an interesting detail in the book of John that the disciple that outran Peter, right? It comes up three different times, but it's always one of those things I smile a little bit at because it's almost, you know, you've made that point well, well enough, all right? Anyway, but the, the Gospel says that when they get there, 
that Peter stooping down, he looked in. It's the same word here. This isn't a passing casual glance, right? I heard somebody use this illustration. I don't wear contacts or glasses, but how many of you wear contacts from time to time or maybe at the moment? All right. Um, and then also, also those also glasses here. Kimberly wears contacts and stuff like that from time to time. Um, so anybody with contacts or married to somebody with contacts knows the experience of trying to find a contact, right? And you lose them. Um, and that's not a walking around just three seconds of casual glance. Eh, oh well, right? Um, that, that often involves getting down on the hands and knees and looking carefully for the contacts, right? Kimberly and I, I, I get that we probably shouldn't say we are old because there's always going to be people that are older than us that say, look, let me tell you what old is about, okay? Um, but we are getting older, and one of the ways that she and I recognized this the other day, she said, uh, what was it, she, she put her glasses down and then she couldn't see to find them, right? You know, that kind of thing. When you have that experience, you're like, oh no, right? Uh, those days are coming. Uh, we haven't yet, I don't know that, well, no, I'm sure at some point we've had that experience where like you're looking and looking and looking and then you realize like your glasses on your head, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, um, but when you're looking for a contact, right, you know, you've seen this experience. Somebody is, they are closely examining, they are appearing, looking for that contact. And that's kind of the idea of this word. This isn't a, a passing glance at the word. This isn't like 15 minutes. And I, I, I don't want to be legalistic that it must be so long or it must be in such a way. Really, it's a hard attitude. Sometimes we only have 15 minutes. But if it's 15 minutes of, Lord, I need this, would you help me listen carefully, and would you help me think about what I'm reading and receive it? Great. That is a 15 minutes well spent. If it's 15 rushed minutes of, okay, at least I read something, and then move on. You know, that kind of, that's what I'm talking about. The, the, the hurried glance at God's word that kind of just bounces off, right? The idea there in James 1.25 is that this is somebody who looks, they peer into the word and not just peer into it, but what's the next thing in verse 25? Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. I think there's the idea of meditation, right? They mean to keep this in their thoughts. They mean to keep this in the way they're living. This is careful, paying attention to the word with a humble heart, ready to learn and ready to receive what God has to say meaning to keep this in my thoughts and live this by God's grace, right? So in other words, how do I get the word more and more into my heart? Well, think of it this way. Again, when we moved here, several volunteers came out and helped us move in, right? Um, and to their regret, they one item after another went out and got it and brought it into the house, right? Um, so we didn't just poof, all of a sudden everything's in. One at a time, it had to be brought in, and once it's in the house, then our family later had to unpack it. Um, praise God, we have a bonus room because not everything's unpacked, and we just don't even need to think about that room, okay? We have unpacked what we need, and that room is holding the things we will need later. Uh, but, but we had to unpack it and put it in its place and then put it to use for us to be at home with our things, right? So in a similar way, day after day after day, verse after verse after verse, I need to be approaching God's word with a heart to go get it and bring it into my thoughts and by God's grace, bring it into my life by putting it to use, right? Lord, help me understand what you're trying to say to me through this. I, and that's the process really of meditation, right? Hearing God's word would be like if volunteers came with, and we had the truck and they just unloaded the truck in the driveway, right? God bless, right? See you later. And sometimes, there's sometimes where, man, you look at some moving jobs, you're like, can we just do that? Can we just, like, can we just put it all in the driveway and then leave, right? Because it's a huge job. Um, it's one thing to have it delivered to you, right? Presented to you. But, man, you got to bring it in. You got to bring it in. You got to unpack it. You got to put it in place. You got to put it to use. Now you're living there with it, right? There was some time there during the day we moved in for a brief time. An assortment of our things was strewn about the driveway, right? Random things. A lamp, you know, boxes, um, a chair probably, a bike, you know, just weird things that if, if it kept looking like that every day that you drive by our house, you'd think, do they live that way? That's a weird way to live, right? If I'm out there in my chair with my lamp, you know, right, <laughs> my driveway, you'd think that's a weird way to live. So for a little while, our life looked strange there for that day. We're just random stuff strewn around the driveway. But, and, and I think there's some people who live their spiritual life like that. They might come to church on Sunday. They might even 
have some sort of relationship where they read their Bible, but it's kind of like it just gets delivered to the driveway. It, 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 they're just hearing it. Man, we've got to bring that stuff in. We've got to really receive that with a meek heart. Put it in place. Put it in the right place. Put it to use. Practice it. And so forth. I didn't hear you, actually. Oh, amen. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, maybe what, what was that? One more time? No, okay, sorry. No, I literally didn't hear you. Actually. Thank you. No, praise God. All right. So last thought here. Last thought. <laughs> what is it that is keeping me or keeping you from this kind of devotion to God through his word? All right, there's a question we got to wrestle with. All right, wherever your present relationship with God through his word is, what's keeping us from it being better? All right. Don't be content where it's at to think, well, you know, it was worse before, you know, I'm doing good. No, what's keeping us from having, from the word having functional control of my whole heart? Right, remember David said in Psalm 119 too, blessed are they that seek him with the whole heart. So what is keeping us from this kind of relationship with God's word? Probably, it's safe to say, you would say, like me, that your relationship to the word is not what it could be, at least not every day, all right? So remember, we are impeded by a weak and even rebellious flesh. Okay, the flesh is not a help here. We don't become more like Christ by, getting a, by improving our flesh. This was a really helpful truth that, that somebody opened my eyes to some while back. It's, it's not that my flesh gets less carnal. It's that I learn to say yes to the spirit more consistently and mortify the flesh. The flesh will always be as carnal as the flesh is. It's been 20 years since I was in college, okay? And the flesh still desires the wicked things the flesh lived for when I was in college. And sometimes I think, man, I should be way beyond that by now. And I should be living way beyond that, yes. But I shouldn't be surprised that the flesh still wants the same things the flesh has always wanted. It's always going to be as wicked as it is. Okay? The flesh doesn't get redeemed. The flesh doesn't improve. We learn to mortify the flesh and to walk in the spirit. Okay? So Galatians 5 didn't say, improve the flesh and then you'll walk in the spirit. No, it said, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we're impeded by this weak and carnal flesh. Um, in other words, there's a reason why 1 Peter 2 instructs us to desire the sincere milk of the word. Think about that for a minute. Again, no one's ever had to tell me, now, Joe, remember, you want ice cream, okay? You're going to get home, you're going to be tired, and you're going to want, you, remember to want ice cream. I'm going to text you later. I'm going to text you later and tell you to want ice cream. I'm going to check to see if you wanted ice cream, right? You're like, Brother, we're good there, okay? All right, you need to check and see if I ate it, because I probably will without accountability. All right, that's, that's more the issue. But the Bible does need to instruct me to desire the word. I find that really interesting. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Right, and we've all seen that. We've all seen a baby who's desperate for milk, and they're pretty blunt about it, right? What baby out there is saying, oh, excuse, you know, excuse me, when, when you have a chance, right? If I could just get a little milk, I mean, I don't want to bother you. I know you're really busy. Like, you probably look like you need a nap, but I'm just saying, like, later on, just a little bit later, if I could just, okay, right? There's no baby out there doing that. They're just openly, I need this. Give this to me. And God tells us we ought to want to desire the word of God that way. But we have to be instructed to want the word because, again, we have these hearts that keep wandering from the word. So we need to pray, again, that God will give us this kind of desire. But in a last thought here, that in addition to the limitations and corruptions of our flesh, it could be that something else has my heart's devotion. And this is where I really got to evaluate and be careful here. Am I really too busy to be spending more time in God's word? I get that there are seasons in life that are truly busy, that are like survival mode. But we do well to step back and evaluate, is everything that I am prioritizing truly as important as I am making it? Where is the room for me to adjust something because I must spend time with God in his word if I'm going to be Christ-like and grow and be nourished spiritually, right? Um, something's got to give, right? So we got to really consider it could be that something else has my heart's devotion. In other words, what is it that's more interesting or desirable to me than pursuing God in his word? a lot of entertaining things. There's a lot of things. And, and we all know that feeling, especially if maybe we didn't get a chance to start the day in God's word. And now we have a little spare time in the evening. Maybe that thought comes into our mind of, man, I haven't spent time in God's word in a few days. That would be a good way to spend the next 30 minutes or whatever. And the next thought's going to be, 
man, and we won't necessarily put it in these words, but that feeling will come into our heart of, I think I'd really rather just turn my brain off for a little while, right? I'd really rather just do something more relaxing. And there's plenty of things out there available to do that, but man, we gotta be careful of that, right? We gotta be careful of that. What is it that's more interesting or more desirable to me than pursuing God in his word? Or what is it that feels more important or is more pressing on my mind than taking the time to be in the word? And again, that's, that's often the case. There are things that truly press on our heart and mind, things that truly must get done. We're under pressure. And we think, I just don't have time right now. I've got to get these things done. And we've heard illustrations of men like George Mueller and others, right? Their response to an even busier workload was, I must rise even earlier for time with the Lord in prayer if I'm going to handle this much workload, right? I must spend even more time in the Word to be ready for this kind of pressure. And we think, oh, and again, not to, not to discourage you, I, I remember a preacher told a story once about a man who heard a message about George Mueller or somebody like that, George Whitfield, or somebody who had, you know, they would rise at four in the morning to have three hours of devotion with the Lord, and the man was really convicted, and he thought, man, I'm going I'm to do that. I'm going to do that. I need to spend time with God in prayer. I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to spend two hours with God in prayer. And he gets up, and he's really tired, right? And he's on his knees, and he's trying to pray. And he's falling asleep, and he's got to wake himself up, right? And he's really struggling, and he's tired, and he keeps falling asleep. And Lord, you got to help me, you got to help me. And I'm, I want, you know, because he wanted to be like George Mueller or like George Whitfield or whoever it was, right? And I want to be devoted. And then after some minutes of trying, and he kept having to wake himself up, finally he just said, Lord, thank you for George Mueller. And he went to bed, right? You know? <laughs> we all know that feeling sometimes of, oh, man, I need to be like that. Well, we, you know, that, that grows step by step. We've got to be careful sometimes of, of setting the bar too high. Um, but again, any even baby steps, we need God's grace. Okay, we, We've got to depend on God to help us to do these things. But, um, but what is it that's more pressing on my mind that's keeping me from spending time in God's word? It may not be bad things, right? It may be things that feel necessary and responsible. Luke, for instance, in Luke 8.14, it talks about one of the things that chokes the word is the cares of this world, Right? There are some things that are legitimate cares, but they become preoccupying and they choke the words ministry in our life, the seed. And I recognize that the application of that, that parable is primarily to the gospel and people getting saved. But I think it's the words ministry in our life is more than the gospel, saving our soul, right? So the cares of this life might be choking it if we're not careful. Consider Martha and Mary. We won't park there. But Luke 10, 38 to 42 tells us the story of Martha and Mary. And you remember this story, right? Jesus comes to their village. Martha is the one who initiates this and invites Jesus into her home. And so she's very busy trying to make everything nice and to put on this meal for Jesus, which is a right thing to want to do. And customarily, Mary would have been in there, right? It was, it was a bit uncustomary for Mary to be with the, the men at the feet of Jesus, like the men would have been. But there she is, because she just hangs on Jesus' every word. And Martha is in the kitchen rejoicing in the Lord and praising God for such grace in Mary's life, right? No, Martha's increasingly irritated that we're trying to get some really important things done in here, and why aren't you in here helping me, right? And, and you sit back and you think, goodness, Martha even goes, she even, like, she interrupts the Lord, right? You notice this in the text? Martha went, to, I mean, Jesus is teaching. He's talking. These people are listening to him, and she comes in there, Jesus, don't you care? She's not even helping me. Tell her to help me, right? And I sit back and I look at that and I think, okay, Lord, in what way am I praying this way? Lord, you're supposed to be helping me get done what I'm trying to get done. And I think there are times when the Lord would look at us and say, I'm, you're not letting me do what I'm trying to do in your life, right? It's what I came to do is more important in your life than what you're trying to do even for me right now. And so there's a lot of times when I get caught up even in good things. And I'm like, I got all these good things I'm trying to get done, Lord, and I'm trying to do them for you, Right? And, and if they're crowding out my devotion to the Lord, my love for the Lord, if I'm no longer just sitting at his feet and letting him minister to me because I need him, then they're too important, right? Jesus says, you are distracted with many things. One thing is needful, right? He's trying to reorient her values here. If those are good things, this is a necessary thing. I need to spend time at the feet of Jesus to learn from him, right? So it may be that I need to evaluate, all right, Lord, what am, I, what am I considering to be more important than humbly sitting under the ministry of your word for you to do in me what I need you to do for me so I can be godly, right? What is more important right now, even if, it's a, if it feels like a necessary thing? So in conclusion, I bring it down to this. The extent of my spiritual victory 
or lack thereof has everything to do with the relationship of my heart to God's word. It has everything to do with that, right? If I need spiritual victory in an aspect of my life, I need more of this book in functional control of my heart, my mind, my will, and my emotions, right? Romans six seventeen says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. What an awesome verse, packed with truth. God be thanked, so it's him that gets the credit, he does this. He does what? He does spiritual victory. God be thanked, you used to be the slaves of sin, meaning now you're no longer enslaved to those sins, you have victory, okay? So where does spiritual victory come from? Because you have obeyed, period. No, that would be legalism, right? If I were to tell you, well, just stop it, right? Just do right more, you know? No, that's not the verse. You have obeyed, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. It's the word that transforms my heart and gives me the grace to live the way God's trying to change me to live, right? It's not just willpower. I don't just say, Lord, I gotta, I gotta stop doing that. I need the word to change my heart and mind so I have grace to live the way God wants me to live. I've gotta be in the word and then I can have victory, right? So victory over sin comes as a result of a heart that is increasingly transformed by the ministry of the word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for time together tonight and thank you for your word. Father, we didn't spend, we didn't look at many verses in Psalm 119, but I do pray that perhaps uh, in the future this psalm could have an ongoing ministry in our lives, maybe as we just get back into it and get reminded of it. But Father, thank you for the testimony of this psalm, what it looks like for a heart to be and experiencing the blessing of being fully impacted by the word. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that it is living and active. We thank you that it is new and fresh every day to us. Thank you for the way that it really is that sincere milk that feeds us and grows us. And we thank you for the way it renews and changes our mind. Thank you for the grace that you give us through your word to enable us to live for you. Lord, we thank you for the faith that you create in us through the word. Uh, you do all these things. Lord, it's you that works in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. So let I pray that you would help each one of us as we go from